Live United. Live United. Live United. Live United. Live United. Vivimos juntos. We live united. We live united. I live united. Hello and welcome to Live United, a show that explores how, when community partnerships are formed and when people work together, lives are enriched and changed for the better. I'm Milton Little, host of Live United. Well, another school year is upon us, and that means lots of preparation. Imagine this scene, parents whisking students off to buy new school clothes and uniforms, new supplies, and trying to instill within them the confidence and perhaps even think about some rewards they might offer for bringing home good grades. Teachers preparing their lesson plans with the hope and expectation that every child would learn at a steady pace. For many in pre-K through 12th grade around the region, learning success is going to be a breeze. But what about those students who start school at a disadvantage? Those students who may not have the same support network of nurturing and guidance and strong positive reinforcements in and outside the classroom. Some families living in extreme poverty or even in homeless situations may not have the income to purchase school supplies or proper uniforms or even breakfast and lunch for their children. Those will put those students at a major disadvantage. Socioeconomic challenges also lower student confidence and self-esteem before those students step one foot inside the classroom, as studies show. How can we as a community help every child enter school ready to learn and graduate prepared for careers? How do we create support networks for success? We'll explore that in our first segment. Then, in our second segment, we will get an update on United Way 211 on how the call center is using enhanced technology and strong community partnerships to reach those in need. We'll get started right after this quick break. The Moms Program has helped me tremendously. They have gave me resources, they've helped me find a place to live. They've helped me find a job. Without them, I don't know how I would've made it. Our goal here in Clayton County is to make sure that our babies aren't born too small, too sick, or too soon. And I think that um, if parents can understand how their children develop, um, it might prevent, which is part of the goal, um, prevent you know child abuse, child neglect. Um, are things that we sometimes see and we wonder, well, why is a parent doing that? And I do believe that sometimes parents don't know. It's not because they don't want to do the right thing or the best thing for their child. I think it's because they don't know. So I think we have a, um, an awesome, fantastic opportunity to be able to help um, parents understand their child's development and in turn help the child be successful. And with the MOMS program, to have that extra support system and have somebody there that really cares, that shows they care and not just say they care, is wonderful. And I feel like every single mom that can fit the criteria should be in the program. Once parents understand what child development is, it's a relief for them because they feel like now they haven't failed, that they're doing the things right. I think that this program can help other parents by giving them the opportunity to see what other things are out there, how to deal with their children. Uh, once we sat down and I got to really know them and what their needs were, I think that's what um, changed the direction of them being part of the program. They feel somehow that they failed, that they're not doing a good job. And so we reinforce that they are doing a good job. We just need to learn what child development is. With the home visits allowing us to share and, and learn some of the activities, developmental activities that are appropriate for his age level. And block play really deals with problem solving, uh, the self-esteem aspect for children, being able to build things up by themselves and 
tear them down. It also deals with a sense of pride at an early age because they want to show their parents that they're able to do it. They're getting a sense of accomplishment and they want to share it with their parents. And I think that in Atlanta, if every parent understood child development, we'd have um, far less incidence of child abuse and neglect. That's one of the fundamental causes is parents are stressed and they don't know what to do and they think that they're failing. And I think if this program were everywhere, then parents would be in a much better position to parent and have that self-confidence. I'd like to welcome Steve White, Center Director for Sheltering Arms Early Learning and Literacy Resource Center. And joining him is Leah Austin. She's the Director of Education Achievement at the Annie E. Casey Foundation Atlantic Civic Site. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about the center, where it's located, uh, the community in which it serves. Um, you know, just let our viewers know what's going on. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Little, for having us. Um, the Early Learning and Literacy Resource Center is part of a complex, the Dunbar Learning Complex, which exists in a set of neighborhoods known as the Neighborhood Planning Unit V, which mm -hmm. is Mechanicsville, Adair Park, Pittsburgh, uh, Capitol Gateway, and Summer Hill. Those are the communities that we primarily serve. Uh, we're in partnership with Atlanta Public Schools. Uh, we're managed by Sheltering Arms, which has been around for 125 years next year, by the way, and um, we manage the early learning piece. But the early learning complex is a facility that, house, that houses children from birth to fifth grade. Uh, we do a really strong transitional piece for our families and our children to ensure our early learning success, which has been uh, really successful over the first two years that we've been in existence, and we're really excited about the work that we're doing. So why was it located there? Were there any particular challenges that the children and families in, in those communities were facing that this center is designed to address? Um, primarily, uh, the lack of quality early learning facilities, okay. primarily. Uh, it's, it's, it's a known fact that children thrive well at uh, older age if they've had the foundation set at an early age. Um, those particular sets of communities over the years have generally been um, uh, not served as well as they should be. And because of it, um, along with the Casey Foundation, uh, foundation uh, they decided, you know, in order to have the community growth that we seek, not only for family work play, it needs to be an educational piece that, that supports the, the families that we're ultimately going to serve. So uh, the idea was formed and here we are. So more specifically, what kind of learning challenges, or not even learning challenges, but challenges uh, are in the way of these children's um, learning success mm -hmm. that you are now able to address? Uh, pr primarily children's uh, inability want to be in this type of space, but, but also parents not having the foundational knowledge of early learning and, and all it entails. Interaction with your children in most instances will help propel your children to where they need to be, but we wanted to be more specific in terms of the building blocks, the, what's developmentally appropriate for children to learn at the early age, and how to facilitate the growth at home. Parents are the primary uh, teachers of our children, and when parents are armed with the knowledge of what early learning looks like and how we can bring that out of our children, then we have that child that we want that to be, and that's that successful child sure. in the future. So. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Leah, the Annie E. Casey Foundation Civic Site, that's yes. a mouthful. <laughs> um, yes, it is. Has a strong commitment to school readiness. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit mm -hmm. about the, the Civic Site and, and its commitment. Absolutely. Um, so one, I'll just begin by sharing that the Civic Site is um, the place-based arm for the Casey Foundation. The Casey Foundation is actually headquartered in Baltimore, okay. um, but due to just some historical relationships, there's a commitment that has been made from the foundation um, here to the city of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and specifically in the set of neighborhoods that Steve mentioned earlier. Um, we have decided that we want to ensure that this particular community has um, choices of high quality places to send children for their early learning education, but then through the continuum. Um, elementary school, middle school, and high school are areas that we will begin to focus on. Right now we're really in the school readiness space, but our overall goal in our education achievement work is to ensure that the children in this set of communities have 
absolutely fantastic choices of schools to attend. So I have the pleasure of leading that work um, and working very closely with Steve on that. Well, that's great. We talk about or we hear talk about risk factors, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that get in the way of children's uh, learning success. What do you see and, and what are you dealing with? Absolutely. Um, you know, a couple of risk factors come to mind um, specifically. Attendance would be one. Um, and attendance, I mean, we know that there, there's some research that shows that just about one out of 10 kindergarten students who come from low income communities um, or families who are surviving on low incomes mm -hmm. misses a total of about 30 days, about a month of school in one school year. Which 10%? Is a, one, yes, one so inch. one out of ten, right. um, which is a tremendous sure. amount of time to be out mm -hmm. of school, especially mm -hmm. that early in their schooling. So attendance is a risk factor, and there are all there are many, many reasons why a child would be um, out of school. But that is a risk factor because we need children to be in school every single day, um, or as much as they can be, so that they really can get the skill set and the development that they need. Um, so attendance is definitely one risk factor that we are trying to put some programming and development mm -hmm. around. Um, in addition to that, summer learning loss. Okay. Um, and when What's this, that? Explain that. Yes. So summer learning loss mm -hmm. is really the absence of educational or learning experiences during the summer months. So when kids are out of school, we would like to see all children attending, going to museums, even if you can't afford a museum, because museums can be costly for the best of us. Mm -hmm. um, just parents reading to their children. Gotcha. Um, so during the summer months, what we see is that children lose some of the ground that's been um, made while they're, while they're in school during the school year. And that's not just in early childhood, but we see that across the continuum. Um, that's why you'll hear a lot of conversations around year-round schooling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, you know, some people love that idea sure. and some people don't just right. because it's year-round schooling. Right. But what it would do, it, it would help to enhance for a lot of the children who are not getting these learning experiences during the summer to either stay on track or enhance what they um, were able to get during the school year so that when they return to school, they're not behind. And what we're learning in our work mm -hmm. every day is social emotional development plays a huge role in the success of children. Mm -hmm. What does that um, mean, social emotional development? Meaning that if you're able to get along with others, right. to work in an environment that exists that is not only geared towards you but others as well, mm -hmm. it makes for a great learning experience in the future because Children don't come out of the womb understanding what it is to get along with others, to be in the same space with others. So uh, that is a learned behavior, and when it and it's only learned if it's enhanced. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's enhanced at an early age, it only makes for uh, greater results. So uh, with social emotional development, we want our children to uh, understand that manners that that being in the same space with others sure. is important. And mm -hmm. it's, it's important to be a good citizen, mm -hmm. as we were all taught when we were young. But it's really important because it's, uh, it's essential to learning. Mm -hmm. You know, you've always heard it said mm -hmm. that, um, you know, there's no manual that prepares Absolutely. you to be a parent. Mm -hmm. So going back to your early point mm -hmm. about um, parents as, as one of the first teachers, mm -hmm. you know, what, tell me, talk, talk about parental involvement, why that's important, and how parents can learn mm -hmm. what they need to do to help mm -hmm. enhance the success mm -hmm. uh, opportunities for their kids. I, I think as, as parents, as we all are, I think parents have an innate uh, desire for their children to succeed, sure. and they love their children. Right. Um, what we want to see more of is a geared effort towards the things that are really essential to uh, school readiness which is reading to your child, which mm -hmm. is having those talk, those conversations, as we call them, five exchanges, you know, at any point during the day, because uh, when language and literacy is developed, right. um, we're arming that child with the, with the ammunition that they're gonna need. Um, we can't rely on just thinking that the educator is the primary um, teacher of the children, mm -hmm. it's the parent. The parent was there from day one. So if you're uh, bridging the gap the learning gap with uh, the children between home and school, it, it's, it's a great experience. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. We've got less than a minute left. Mm -hmm. um, Leah, we've talked a lot about the youngest kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have any reflections on um, what's happening with older 
children and, and maybe some of the parents out there who are worried about their kids who are 9, 10, 14, 15, mm -hmm. what, what can you say? You know, my um, reflection or, or thinking on that is that we talk a lot in the early ed space about talking to children yes. and asking them questions. Right. And as um, silly as it may sound, that would be my advice for parents as they are raising their children across the continuum. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe in some ways even more so in junior high and high school is the constant talking and asking questions, not only um, in terms of developing vocabulary, but also really tapping in to understand what children are going through and what kind of support they may need. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, parent involvement. Is, is crucial and um, not just for the youngest kids. Not just for the okay. youngest kids, for all of our children, um, because uh, a lot of what we see in today's society is a direct reflection of what may not have occurred when uh, the child was young. Um, but now, what we see, we still have an opportunity to change the tide, and a lot of that is just taking on the responsibility of being there for your child, talking to your child, and and just understanding that they are people who are young, but they are they have a mind and they have the ability to learn. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Leah. You guys were great. You've shared a lot of valuable information. According to Voices for Georgia's Children, 43% of young children are exposed to risk factors that lead to unhealthy child development. These factors include premature birth, poverty, parents with less than a high school education, and single parent homes. United Way and committed partners like the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Sheltering Arms, Boys and Girls Clubs, Families First, and others are ensuring kids enter school ready to learn and graduate prepared for careers. United Way recently invested more than $7 million in education programs that support families, children, and learning success because no child should have to attend school on day one without a support structure that gets them on the right track. No child should be left behind and no child should start school feeling inferior, vulnerable, or unsupported. As districts kick off another academic year, remember that learning success begins with a belief, a belief that each child can build the confidence to overcome any challenge, whether it's poverty, homelessness, bullying, or any other unfortunate situation. Only 67% of Georgia students graduated from high school in 2011. But we can't give up hope. By working together, we will change the odds. Writer Norman Vincent Peale once said, believe you can and you can. Belief is one of the most powerful of all problem solvers. When you believe that a difficulty can be overcome, you are more than halfway to victory. We'll be right back. Change. It begins with a simple act. An outstretched hand, an open door, a second chance. Together, the momentum of our actions is a force unlike any other. Clearing the way to new beginnings. Higher hopes, bigger dreams, a gift to United Way means a child has a chance to learn. A mother has a healthy newborn. A young man earns a stable living. A family has a place they're proud to call home. Giving to United Way, a simple act, changes the course of a life. The position of the family and shapes the future of your community. Giving to United Way simply changes you. Be the change you want to see. Be Greater Atlanta. Welcome back. While many in Metro Atlanta continue to struggle making ends meet in this lagging economy, United Way's 211 call center remains a critical link for those searching for help with utility, rent, or mortgage payments and other resources. Even with more than 6,500 organizations and programs in the 211 database, 
Unfortunately, some resources are dwindling because needs are just too great. Joining us next is Donna Burnham, director of our 211 call center, and Patricia Jimenez Ronca, Credibility's Hispanic External Affairs Manager. They're here to update us on new strategies to address the growing needs in the community and to explain why, why forming partnerships is the best approach to help our neighbors cope in these very tough times. Welcome, Patricia, and welcome, Donna. Thank you. Thank thanks, you very much. Thanks for being here. Donna, I don't know that a lot of viewers know about 211, so mm -hmm. talk about 211, talk about how many people contact 211, who the people are, and what they call for. Well, 211 is a three digit number that connects people to health and human services. So you can dial 211 from a cell phone or a landline to receive help or to give help. Um, Atlanta is actually the very first 211, so we've been around for about 15 years now. The types of people that call us are people that are needing some type of basic needs, mm -hmm. like your food, your rent, your mortgage, um, paying an electric bill. Um, last year we helped over 350,000 callers. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. And they're calling for those kinds of things. Yes. I need help with my mortgage or rent or food. or Absolutely. We're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have Spanish-speaking agents around the clock. Um, and we're able to translate over 140 languages. Oh, that's, a, that's impressive. Patricia, say a little bit about credibility. I'm not sure everybody knows what credibility is, who it serves, and what it does. Sure. Credibility is a nonprofit uh, consumer credit counseling agency. Okay. We are um, open 24 hours. We uh, are on the web, mm -hmm. on the phone, by chat, instant chat. We do everything that we do in English and in Spanish. So we have been here for um, uh, almost four years. So we have been helping a lot of people during those, those years. So w when I call credibility, mm -hmm. um, what's the typical reason why I'm calling and what kind of help can you provide? People call us because they're, they're behind in their mortgage and they really want to avoid foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Or they call us because uh, they are just behind in their bills. Or maybe they want to buy a house and they don't know how to do it. So it's a, a, a variety of reasons what people call us. And, and, and we try to help everybody finding the best uh, solution to their specific situation. So there sounds like a synergy between credibility in, in 211 because Donna was saying people call with some of those very same um, concerns. So what's the value of a partnership with the United Way um, in your mind? Well, you know, nonprofits normally, we don't have a lot of money to advertise. Mm -hmm. So in order to connect people that uh, have some needs yes. with resources, 211 is the best, the best link. Um, 211 have in, in, uh, having in their uh, database agencies like Credibility, mm -hmm. um, they actually give that information to the people in need, and the only thing that they have to do is connect with the agencies. Um, actually, it's, I, th I think that, that synergy is incredible. Uh, instead of us trying to go everywhere saying, hey, we're here, uh, 211 does that for us. So when somebody calls and says they were referred by 211, what are they usually saying they were referred for and what are they coming to you? Well, they say I cannot pay my mortgage, mm -hmm. for example, or I cannot pay my, my, uh, my bills completely, mostly credit cards, that type of thing. Or in many cases, they cannot pay the rent and it's because they are paying some other things. So we help them to do a budget to see how they can pay their bills in order for them not to be in that situation, I mean, over and over. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you hear a lot about people in, in difficult circumstances, okay. but you must also be able to share a story or two about somebody who's been able to turn things around because of this partnership and the work of credibility. Is there yeah. a success story that you might Yeah, I think? remember. I remember this, this, uh, um, this uh, um, elderly person. Uh -huh. And uh, she was having a, a, some problems with different things, but mostly with credit cards. What happened is that 
she received many offers of credit cards. And you know, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, nice APR, right. uh, money, the cash, cash back, sure. all that kind of stuff. Right. And she said, good, maybe I can use this to buy things that I need. Well, I mean, in, in a minute, she was really, really in trouble. I'm sure. So we, um, she called 211. 211 uh, direct them to us. But at the same time, 211 direct her to some other agencies that help her to pay the rent and et cetera. We help them with, we help her with, um, with the budget. And actually, we are now working with her in order to uh, lower the interest rate on their credit card so she can pay it. Mm -hmm. so, so see, it's, it's like kind of a, a teamwork, That's let's great. say. That's yeah. great, great, great story. I'm happy to hear that. Donna, 15 years ago or so, you know, people were reaching 211 by dialing it. Yes. You know, what's going on today with the explosion of all kinds of innovative information technologies. Has that changed what's going on the 211? Yes, we have made several enhancements that mm -hmm. we're very proud of. You can now live chat with us. Um, live chat is available Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 p.m. Okay. We also have the ability to text and email referrals to callers. Mm. And that is a huge benefit for the hearing and visually impaired community. Um, um, in the fall, we should have the 211 app available. So individuals can just download the 211 app to their iPhone or iPad, and they will have the 211 resources right at their fingertips. And then now we also are working on, um, we're, we're also working on an online um, tutorial for individuals to use our database, because mm. we want to make sure that our database is user friendly. And so that should be available in August. With about 30 seconds left, Donna, um, any final thoughts you want to share with our audience about 211? I want um, individuals to know that if you are looking for in, um, information for, on health and human services, if you need help or if you want to help in the community through volunteerism or donation, 211 should be the very first point of connection. Well, that's great. Thank you, Donna, for joining Thank the you. show. Thank you, Patricia, for all that you and credibility do in our community. United Way 211 consistently seeks out valuable partners like credibility to join our database for those in need. As we expand our list of generous partners able to extend a hand, we also have to remain mindful of the changing ways people are communicating and reaching out for help. Chat, email, and text, driven by mobile devices and social media, are now becoming popular vehicles of communication. From June 2010 to June 2011, more than 117,000 users searched 211's online database for information and services. Adapting to these changing trends will help keep 211 flexible and responsive to community needs. We invite you to be part of this movement by offering our neighbors hope together. If you are a faith based organization, nonprofit, for profit, or government agency with available capacity who'd like to join our 211 database, go to unitedwayatlanta.org forward slash 211. We'll see you next time.